What's up vlog, it's everyone's favorite California license attorney, Amir Afsar, and on this episode of Unbillable, we had a chance to sit down with NBA franchise owner, Dick Heckman, talk to him a little bit about some of his business successes. Take a look and see what you can pull out of it for yourself. I'd like to bring up Amir Afsar from Afsar Law. Thanks, Peggy. Hello everybody, thanks for uh, joining us for our second installment of the Leadership Luncheon Series. Uh, it's great to be back. I survived the first uh, bout with Tim Bradley. It's good to see some uh, faces from that event here. Uh, and so I figured it would be much easier uh, after uh, sparring with a five-time world champion to host another one of these things. Uh, and then they lined up another massive heavy hitter for me. I think locally most people know our guest today, Richard Heckman, Dick Heckman, as the founder and seller of U.S. Filter. Dick Heckman is the chairman and CEO of K2, Inc. He joined with the state of California to build what's being referred to as the Heckman Center, but which he himself definitely refers to as the International Center for Entrepreneurial Management. He is also, and I think, maybe one of the most attractive parts of this bio, an owner of the Phoenix Suns. And admittedly, I'm a big Los Angeles Lakers fan, but I did my best to not wear a hat or a face tattoo or any of those things. And I promised we wouldn't talk too much about getting LeBron James today. So with that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce today's Fireside Chat, Fireside Chat speaker, Dick Heckman. So thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your lunch. I know you only got a couple bites in. It's a couple bites more than me though. I wanted to start a little bit about rewinding the clock back before the business transactions you're, you're most well known for. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about the young boy, Dick Heckman, the, the, the child, the kid. Well, I, I was raised in the Midwest. Um, my father worked in a warehouse. Um, uh, and I was, uh, I, I, the kind of student I was, uh, I, I always hoped my kids would do better. I, I, I always say I, I graduated from high school in the top 95% of my class. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the half that made the top half possible. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I went uh, through a, a, a RLTC program, and um, while I pressed my kids to go to great schools, I went to the University of Hawaii, and, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, went off to Vietnam and came back and, and kind of uh, beat around uh, entrepreneurially until, uh, until uh, I started several companies. Uh, some successful, some not, but uh, mostly successful. Well, let, me, let me slow you down a little bit there. Can we talk about some of the unsuccessful stuff? In the United States, in the 60s, there was no requirement for an airplane to have a rescue beacon on it. So every time an airplane would go down in the United States, you'd lose people trying to find the airplane uh, because they never go down you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an accessible place. So we brought out a rescue beacon, got it lobbied into federal law, and we're on top of the world until uh, until we learned about cash flow, and um, so we were we were riding high. We, we had a great business until the big boys came in and they killed us, and that was it. Probably the, the success was I started a little company that made artificial. Uh, I bought us a, 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 a shell. A company made artificial hips and knees uh, in 1972, and uh, grew it into a big enough business set in 1977. It was acquired uh, by a big uh, public company, and that was kind of the, the beginning. Okay, so, and then, that, would you call that the second business then? I, I know you for the, the first one is the Beacons. Yeah, the, 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 Tower, the Tower Scientific was the name of it. it, it, it we, it, to, to give you, first of all, everybody always asks, you know, what's the secret? It's a really easy secret that all of you have, and that's luck. It, 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 you know, you have to be lucky and be in the right place at the right time. We were making artificial uh, specialized hips and knees that were not off-the-shelf products. They were for people who had had to have one removed or had cancer and had a lot of bone removal. Special prosthetic devices that the big boys would take 16 weeks to do. And we were trying to do them faster and get the market. And then along comes this guy from Yale called Fred Smith. And he invents Federal Express. And now, all of a sudden, we can ship things overnight to 65 major cities in the United States. Changed our business overnight and made us the largest company in the country at 
had custom prosthetic devices. And then everybody wanted to buy us. But, but you know, without Fred Smith, without Federal Express, it doesn't happen. So, so when Fred Smith walks into your life, um, how, how do you look at that as a positive thing and not fear the change? Well, you, you can't ever fear change. I mean, you, you have to always, it, it, was, it was so obvious what was going to happen. I mean, Federal Express was going to change everything. I, I would say today, if you're going to sell retail, you better, sell, you better figure out how to do it online. You know, building stores is not going to be the future of retail. So if, if, if you're going to, if, you know, if you're, you either have to be in something that Amazon can't do or something you can get Amazon to do for you, broadly speaking. Same thing was true back with Federal Express. When Federal Express came in, anybody that didn't recognize that wouldn't think of it because it changed everything. It changed, Federal Express changed everything. And it absolutely changed our business. And uh, we, we embraced it, used it, and it was phenomenal. And so after the extra growth of your business, you sold that business, right? Sold that business to Hometica, a big, uh, big public company, and, um, uh, and, and went into the, into the government for a while. Okay, so uh, went into the government. Is yeah. this the uh, Small Business Administration? Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about your experience uh, with the SBA? Well, it was it was uh, it was really interesting. Um, I I was offered a job as the deputy at the SBA and um, and had never been in Washington and thought it'd be fun and and uh, and, and went back for three years and uh, in, in the Carter administration as as their senior Republican. Um, but uh, it was a, it was a phenomenal experience to see how the government can't work. Yeah, and, and it's never going to work. So how much time did you spend uh, in Washington then? Three years. Three years. And then coming out of Washington, what was next? Uh, when coming out of Washington, I came back here to uh, the desert. Uh, I had lived in Seattle. The hip and knee business was in Seattle. But when I went to D.C., it was a revelation that when you wake up in the morning, the sun comes out. Um, and I was used to Seattle where you wake up in the morning and it's raining every day. And so I decided I wasn't going to go back to the rain and the valley seemed like an interesting place. I'd never lived here, but um, I just wanted sunshine. So uh, we moved here from D.C. And, um, and have been here since 1979. So, so can I ask you, how does the Coachella Valley get on your map way back then? Uh, In-laws. <laughs> they were, were they living here at the yeah. time? Yeah, they were living here at the time. So, and I'd never been here. We came here to visit them, and it was so fabulous. Were you a golfer? Uh, yes, I was a golfer, and uh, but I, I just I, I, and and it, what, what's really interesting is Filter was headquartered here, and you had a Fortune 500 company headquartered here, and every single CEO that would visit me was jealous. <laughs> I mean, they'd walk in the door and there were bougainvilleas over the door and, you know, everybody's kind of dressed casually and the sun's out and everybody's happy and I can't tell you how many limousines pulled up that door and they'd walk in and say, you lucky dog. U.S. Filter eventually sells for the outstanding sum of $8.2 billion and whatever amount of that goes to your pocket, I'm sure you take and go straight to uh, some island somewhere and just hang it up and pina coladas and, right? No, the problem is you get investoritis. Once you've done a successful deal, you are dying to do it again. And you're dying to prove that you weren't lucky. And I can't tell you how many stories I read about how lucky I was at Filter. And every one of them teed me off. So I, I immediately decided to do it again and went after another company, which was struggling, which was called K2. Okay, so, but you just said you were teed off about people calling you lucky. Yeah. But at least twice now you've said luck plays this. Well, it is luck, but you have to recognize it. So you can be lucky and stupid, <laughs> or lucky and lucky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or based on this story, like one out of four or five is not bad, maybe. Yeah, no, in all of you, you know, people always say, where do you find, where do you find the business? Um, I was, I was involved in nothing three days ago until this announcement came out about this company coming apart and I just picked up the phone, made a couple of phone calls and now we've got a group that's going after. All of you in this room have seen or missed or taken a chance at something that worked. I remind me of a, of a trout in a stream with its nose up in the air waiting for bugs to come by. 
You, you don't get them all, but if you just get one, you get food. And and so so I I would suggest to you that if you think back through your life at the opportunities you've had, Renova is a great example. I, I I was around for the founding of Renova, and you know I I, I just wasn't sure that solar was ever going to work. You're kind of segueing perfectly here. I know you have a, a little bit of like a mentor relationship with Renova and, and its CEO, Vince Pataglia. Um, what about you, though? Did you have any mentors when you were building absolutely, your business? Absolutely, absolutely. I worked for a guy at Beige who was an incredible man. His name is George Ball, still alive. Uh, his name is George Ball, and he was the greatest leader of men I've ever seen. And we would have gone through brick walls for him. And when I took over, and, and I went from base to starting filter. And when I took over filter, I literally tried to copy every single thing he did at base, and it was amazingly successful. And and why reinvent the wheel? I mean, if 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 he motivated all of us, why couldn't I just copy what he does and motivate all of my folks? And that's exactly what I did. We went from two employees to twenty six thousand employees in eight years. I mean, that's pretty good growth. And it takes a lot of motivation. <laughs> and it takes a lot of talking and a lot of cajoling. And this guy was the best I'd ever seen, and I copied everything he did. You mentioned earlier about your children's accomplishment and how proud you are of them. And so, you know, I'm curious to see, you know, when your children talk of you and, and building this large business, I mean, what, what are some of the traits that you think they've inherited from you uh, in building such a large company besides uh, good luck? It takes a couple of years for them to listen to you. And then, um, then it becomes very collaborative. Mostly, uh, by my advice has been what all of your advices would be to all of your kids. It's, it's business isn't hard. It, you know, you know it's wrong to lie to your customers. Don't lie to them. You know it's wrong to cheat your vendors. Don't cheat them. You know it's wrong to mistreat your employees. Don't mistreat them. Instincts are everything in business. Instincts have driven you since you were 16 years old. How many times do we all say, shit, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> but we did it anyway. And, and, and all I've tried to do is instill in them that, that their instincts are good. If you're a good shooter, shoot. Quit looking around and decide whether you should shoot or not. If you're a good shooter, shoot. And if you're a bad shooter, don't shoot. What is, what's a takeaway? We know you're in a room full of people who've participated in one way or another with our Leadership Coachella Valley program. What do you think is a takeaway that you could give or a, a little nugget of wisdom you could give to uh, these uh, leaders here in the room um, that maybe they could take with them today and, and use as an action point? You know, what I, what I always used to, that's a good question. I don't know whether this will be a good answer or not. But uh, what I used to say to all of our people as we were building these businesses is think about what would happen if you weren't there? Who will care when you're gone? Who will care when you if, you, if you left your position, what would happen? Who would care? Who would take over? I think you always have to be thinking about what am I bringing to this business? What am I doing to make this business better? And who's gonna care if I'm gone? If the answer is probably nobody, then you ought to do something else. If the if the answer is um, uh, if the answer is people are really going to care if I'm not here, people are really going to care if this company doesn't make it. If you have a law firm, and, and and you know there should be a lot of people that care that you're there, and 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 will care if you're not there. And I think you you always have to operate your business, your division, your job, always thinking about what would happen if I wasn't here. Am I really making a difference? And if you're not making a difference, go do something else. Because you're not going to ever make a lot of money or get a lot of happiness doing something that you don't care about doing or that nobody else cares about. So, so you know, it was, it was just ask yourself, who would care if I'm gone and why? And the answer will tell you how successful you are. And the answer will give you guidance. I, I think that's a great answer, frankly. That's great. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much.
what can I say? It's not every day you get to sit down with an NBA franchise owner like that. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unbillable, and if you did, hit the like button. It would be great. Also, be sure to comment. If you have something to share, something that you want to add, hit it in the comments below, and if you want to subscribe to keep up to date with everything going on with me and my main man behind the lens, Bubba, be sure to subscribe. It would mean a lot to us. And with that, thanks for tuning into this episode. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Unbillable. <laughs>